Irish diaspora in Britain. Tony Lloyd to move. Last uh, can call here, uh, um, Lorela Podrick uh, Suna Deev. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, that's the hard bit of my speech now. Um, it's worth recording that whilst there are something around 600,000 people who declare themselves to be Irish living in, in uh, Great Britain, um, the, the true figure, if we look at those who are first, second generation, is probably something like 10% of the population in this country, some 6 million people. It should be 60 plus MPs with us here today on that basis, uh, alas, uh, not. Um, actually, it's, it's proportionally, though, more Britons living in Ireland than uh, Irish living in Britain, which is a, an interesting statistic. But I say that because, of course, we have a very complicated relationship between our two islands, very complicated, a complicated history, but one that's been interwoven not just over a few hundred years, but over literally uh, thousands of years, from St. Patrick travelling one way, uh, St. Columba travelling another way, etc. And the, of course, those of us who have some claim to, uh, to Irish background are very proud of that background. Growing up in uh, a very Irish city like Manchester and an Irish part of that city, listening to Radio Erin in, in, uh, at breakfast every morning, it's instructive to the I knew as much about the Tallyman's projections of an Irish election uh, to know uh, long before it was declared the, that the last uh, seat in Donegal would be uh, go to Fianna Fáil, virtually always, um, or even better that I knew which was the, at least the advertised prescriptions for, for worming cows. Now, I never managed to use that piece of information, but nevertheless, I've always felt it was, it was in good stead. But Manchester was a very Irish city. Um, the Irish were rightly everywhere. At the time of the Munich air crash, um, one of the players who died, Billy Whelan, was Irish, but actually one of the heroes was, uh, was the goalkeeper, Harry Gregg, Northern Ireland's goalkeeper, who dragged... Uh, different people, Bobby Charlton amongst them, out of the, the ruins of, of the plane and became um, a, a legend on that basis. A legend on the football field as well because a few months previously he'd helped Northern Ireland defeat England and uh, Northern Ireland went on to play in the 1958 World Cup. Um, when United won, I'm glad to say, slightly after Celtic, uh, the European Cup in 1968. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we looked. I, I give a part of the Irish team there as well. I think um, <laughs> we we we, uh, we, we recognised, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, a, a team that four of the players, um, Shea Brennan, Tony Dunn, um, the very Scottish but very Irish Pat Crow, and, and of course the great George Best, uh, all claimed Irish origins. And um, you couldn't ignore the Irish in Manchester. Now, to a degree, of course, the, the image of the Irish in those days was perhaps of, uh, of builders, uh, um, of nurses. And to a degree, that's true. My good friend John Kennedy, known to many people in this chamber, um, came with nothing in his pocket from County Mayo. Uh, but John built a business that allowed me now, as an older man, to be a philanthropist. My even equally very good friend, God rest his soul, Rita Marr, probably nursed more people uh, back to life, some towards the end of their life, in the course of their life, um, than I had mugs of tea in her kitchen over those many years. And those were the people who perhaps were the archetypal working class Irish. But actually, it would be a mistake to see the Irish just, even though there are 200,000 Irish people working in, in our NHS, the Irish were much more than that. Go back to Robert Boyle, the father of modern chemistry, Irish born, um, but lived long, long parts of his life in England. Britain's greatest general, um, uh, the, uh, um, the Duke of Wellington, Victor at Waterloo, was uh, Dublin born. And of course, um, the Bronte sisters, uh, famed as Yorkshire women writers, their father was from Northern Ireland. We've got Oscar Wilde, we've got George Bernard Shaw, um, who made their contribution to uh, British society. Um, from their Irish backgrounds. And of course, more recently, very proud, I am um, to say, Dennis Healy, Jim Callaghan, both of Irish origins. More recently, Danny Boyle, Carolina Hearn, but um, Professor Theresa Lamb, one of the co creators of the AstraZeneca vaccine, all from Irish backgrounds. So the contribution is much wider than that image of, of builders, uh, of, of nurses, and even though the MacAlpine's Fusiliers did declare, as down the glen, uh, Ken McAlpine's men with the, with the shovels uh, pressed behind them. 
Uh, nevertheless, we have the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, the academics, uh, everything that the Irish contribute to this country. And that's great to be able to record that. We have this complicated history between um, the, the, these, these two islands, and it's one that has caused problems. There's no doubt that whilst the north of Ireland suffered most during the Troubles, there's no part of these two islands that didn't suffer. My own city saw um, uh, the, the, the IRA bomb in, in, in the late 90s. The Good Friday Agreement was a triumph of uh, not just Bertie Hearn, not just Tony Blair, although they were instrumental in their perseverance in making the Good Friday Agreement work. It's many, many others who, made, who were there to bring that into being. It was so important because it wasn't just about peace. It wasn't even about reconciliation. It's about a very different way of living together, a, a way of mutuality, of respect between the people of these two islands, the people living across these two islands. And that's something that's worth recording because it's taken a knock in recent years. I don't want to run the Brexit debate. It's not the right time to do that. But let me say Brexit has confounded and confused the relationship between uh, these two countries and it's impacted on the Irish living in Britain. We've got to get back to getting that right because we owe that not simply to the Irish in Britain, not simply to the Britons in Ireland. We owe it to all our, um, our, 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 our peoples that we get that right once again. And that's a big prize, I think, uh, that, uh, that we've got to pursue. Because in, in the end, um, that mutuality of respect is what we should be about. Um, when I talked to Brian Dalton of the, uh, the Irish in Britain Society, um, alas, uh, stricken with COVID, um, good luck to you, Brian. The, the reality is, Madam Deputy Speaker, he would say that the challenges that the Irish in Britain face, of course they are about making sure that we, we live well together, but it's some of the challenges that we face in common. It's dementia amongst an elderly and an ageing Irish population. It's heart um, conditions amongst an Irish population whose diet probably wasn't always that good in the youth. So it's all the things that we face together. It is about a recognition of Irish heritage and what that means in modern society. But there is something almost more important than that. These six million people of Irish origins in this land of ours are, um, are the template for the way this, and I say this with, with pride, this mongrel nation of ours, because we are a mongrel nation, brought together from our many different strands, the way we treat and respect each other. If we can use the Irish in Britain as the template for the way in which we respect heritage, the way in which we respect each other, we achieve something that's important for modern Britain. Uh, we achieve something that's important as well, of course, for the relationship between our two islands. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very proud to be part of that so hand-me-down Irish diaspora. Um, I'm very proud that, that uh, my colleagues are here today to speak on what I think is a tremendously important issue. But I'm very proud, actually, because what um, the Irish in Britain represent is the best of modern Britain, along with those people who weave the tapestry of what we are as a nation. So um, I'll finish on this note. I won't do this in Irish, Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> I'll just say, may the blessings of St. Patrick be with us all this day. And may the blessings of St. Patrick actually I say this with Shamrock and a Ukrainian badge at my lapel be with the people of Ukraine as well. Because the peace we want between these two islands, we want around this world as well. The question is, as on the order paper,